Welcome, everybody, to That Poker Podcast, episode 98. Oh, we're inching towards the 100. Uh, it is uh, April 5th, 2021. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside producer extraordinaire, Roscoe P. Coltrane. Buongiorno. Uh, Terrence Chan. T, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Um, I, I did want to ask you, though, when we did the show last week without Daniel, did it make you feel like you were more of an apex predator? <laughs> I, uh, I did. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, and I got up and I did one of these after the, after the show was done. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, Daniel Negreanu, Las Vegas, uh, the green screen. You've got the green screen on Daniel. I was, ha I had my typical thing and then I noticed the green was being weird and whatever. So I just turned it off and you can see behind the little behind the scenes of what you know, a, ba a zoom background entails. I cover the chair with green. I got a green back screen over here. I don't know. My guy does it. I don't know shit. I, I have like, if they're like, if there was a level of patience from one to a hundred, I'm like negative four for audio tech shit. I, I just, my go-to is smash the shit. Hammer oh, we were, smash. Yeah. I, I wish Ross was recording before we even started. Cause I think your, your audio wasn't working for like, what was probably about three minutes and you were already on raging tilt. Can't take it. Three minutes. I, I can't take it. 30 seconds. I can't take it. I have a very short attention, uh, patience for that shit. That's good. We got you on, uh, you're a little bit ornery tonight. So when we, when we do the <laughs> recap, you're, you'll be uh, quite opinionated. I like it. I'm happy about that. All right. Uh, lots happened in the book world this week. Uh, as Terrence mentioned, we didn't have Daniel for the podcast uh, last week because he was playing the high stakes duel uh, match number one against uh, Phil Helmuth. Um, and we'll get into that. And also, uh, the World Series of Poker announced uh, the live version of the tournament uh, will be held this year in Las Vegas. We'll get to uh, the dates and some of the details around that um, as well. So let's just uh, jump right into it. Um, I want to talk about the uh, the high stakes duel that happened. The, the whole poker world's talking about it. Um, first off, before we get into you know some of the poker stuff, you know there was it, it was a sort of a made for streaming uh, poker go events um and you know much like when you have a ufc you have a hype show you have a way in you know you get to some of this stuff before the actual uh fight or uh match in this case um and it was entertaining and and here's the thing like it was hard to tell and it's so hard to tell with phil all the time and you know how much of this is real and how much of this is he's he's done an amazing job building an image of the poker brad and and uh you know, all the antics and how much of it is real. Well, I, I think we all probably agree a lot of what Phil does is real. He, you know, he's, uh, he, he feels slighted and he takes offense and, and he got into that with, with some of the stuff before the show. He, and so here's what happens, Daniel, you and Phil sit down at the, at the table. Um, Nick Shulman is in between in the dealer's spot and uh, he's about to ask some questions. You can see he's got prepared, like, you know, he's got a hype show to do here and some questions that he's done up. And Phil doesn't even let him get to question number one, like just jumps right in. I got a bone to pick with Daniel. I got a bone to pick with, with, um, with Nick. And, and he just goes off and he goes on a, a couple of rants. Um, and you know, it, it, it's funny, right? Because we're watching this and as sort of people in the poker industry, you kind of know that there's a little bit of the showmanship going on, but there's also a little bit of, uh, of himself in there. And, and Danny, I wanted to ask you first, how much of that sort of pre-show that we'll talk about here or pre-match was actually Phil trying to be the, the, the showman or, you know, that he was actually upset about some of the things you and Nick said about him? Yeah. Okay. So first and foremost, you got to have like some empathy for the, for Nick showman's job here because he's got like no shot, right? Before we start, Phil has the, Phil does this to me a lot, right? We go on a show together. He's like, all right, let me talk. Let me say my thing first. And then you can talk but don't interrupt me. Okay. And he tells Nick the same thing. That's what he does. I'm going to say I have. So we start the show. I sit there. Like I don't say a word. He goes on one, two, three, four, like every fucking point. And Nick he even said to Nick, he's like, I have a bone to pick with you. And Nick's like, listen, I don't want it to be about me. This is you two guys. Like, leave it alone. Like for all intents and purposes, Nick is very soft on Phil. You know, he's never calling Phil a sucker and saying, this is terrible. He just says things like, you know, yeah, that's not a play I would make. Right. He was, you know, he's very nonchalant about it. He doesn't say it's like horrendous or it's mathematically bad. He just says, you know, not a play I would make, but Phil does his thing, right? And gives him credit where credit is due. But Phil, you know, he uh, he set it up beforehand. Then he does, so basically, poor Nick. It's like how he wants to start the show, he doesn't get to. Because Phil says, this is how we're starting. 
He says four different things. And then it's like, okay, how do you respond, Daniel? I'm like, holy fuck. I got to go through all the four points. So at one point I just look at Nick. I'm like, after the back and forth, I'm like, do you have any questions? Cause like the poor guy couldn't get a word in, you know? Um, but Phil, I think as far as how much of it's real, Phil takes his legacy very seriously, right? He loves the world series of poker. He's been around a long time. You know, he's the, he's the most decorated world series of poker player ever. So when people start to question, you know, his game, which everyone does because they see, you know, what are not, I and mean, this isn't arbitrary. This isn't like a maybe, there's just mistakes, right? Like there are certain situations in poker that are provable, okay? That are provably correct or incorrect, right? And, you know, he makes some that are not and that's okay. We all do, but like, he doesn't think so, right? He's like, he says something to the effect of, I'm either way- Well, you have one way of describing it, I have another. Yeah. He says either I'm either I'm way behind the curve or I'm way ahead of it that nobody can see how <laughs> light years ahead I am, right? Um, which prompted me to do a video. I did a video that released on YouTube, uh, it should be yesterday, where I basically break down, and, and we can go over it here on the show, like the, the hands where he calls me an idiot and really berates me. But before we get to that, yeah, the pregame stuff, no, feels heated. You know, that's that's real heat. He's, you know, he, he, because of, like I said, he takes his legacy so seriously, he... Um, he, it matters to him that he's like lumped in with the greats. Cause listen, for, throughout his career, he's a tournament guy. He never played high stakes in Bobby's room with Doyle and chip and Phil Ivy and Johnny Chan and all these guys. Like he's kind of just the tournament guy, but he wants to be on their level. And you know, he does everything he can to phrase things in such a way or to point to statistics or information or data that says, look, I'm in the same boat as Doyle Brunson because I have 15 bracelets, you know? And I guess, you know, to him, that's, that's really important. So I think it's, it's real. For the most part, yeah, it's real. Terrence, do you think do you think it's real? And and you know, is does he think he understands or gets? And and maybe it's just me, but it seems like the poker world kind of laughs at him when he does this stuff. Now, I don't think he wants people laughing at him, but it seems like we are. No, but it's really easy to sort of, and that's why he has. I think Daniel kind of hit the psychology on the head there. It's. It's it's a it's a bit of a defense mechanism to protect against all of this stuff too because he does get criticized you know when he makes something that's just as Daniel says mathematically provably an incorrect play like it can't be right to you know to to do things like you know open and fold off of six big blinds and stuff that, that, that he does like that you can you can just prove that these things are wrong um, and so when when people say that these things are wrong it's a defense mechanism it's like they don't really understand like there's no there's no, there's never an attempt to, to logic out why he makes the plays that he makes, right? You never hear him, you never hear him like walk through a hand step by step the way that you hear other top level poker players be like, okay, well, this is, these are all the hands that he, I thought he could possibly have. And I thought if I did this, and it's, it's always just sort of this white magic, like well, I this apex it. predator shit, just to stop the here. apex predator shit. It's, it's always very vague, right? And, and like, you can't, you can't argue against that. You can't, you, can, you know, you can't say like, you can't argue against white magic. You can't argue against apex predator shit. So this is the stuff that he does to, to just sort of be defensive about right, it. Right. Like he will look at, sorry to interrupt real quick, but no, he will look ahead. at it. He will look at evidence where if he limps with King Jack and the big line raises and had King Queen or Ace Jack and made it like three X and he folds, he's like, see, that's some apex predator shit, which side note, that whole apex predator shit. I didn't know that was coming. Nobody did. But a week before, GG, we came up with an April Fool's thing where my next opponent would be, I, I couldn't believe it. My next opponent was the Predator, the Apex Predator. So like we literally the very next day have this little ad, this cute little bit about me playing against the Predator. And this is right after he said Apex Predator. And it wasn't, and I was like, did you know or something? And I totally had no idea. And I totally thought you guys were playing off what Phil said. Exactly, right? But it couldn't, you couldn't get it done that fast, right? So we shot the stuff a week before, you know, and whatever. And then he just busts out the Apex Predator. And I'm like, how is this real life? This is crazy. Yeah. And, and I wonder how much of that, what, what Terrence, what you just said, like he doesn't talk through hands. You know, Phil would say, well, I don't want to share my, the way I look at hands with the rest of the, but really, do you think it's probably him not wanting to embarrass himself to you? Maybe. I mean, I think, yeah, like there's, there's, there's some part of him that is aware, as Daniel said, he, he's never played the high stakes in Bobby's room. And, and I think part of that is, is sort of like, there's a little bit of knit in him. I mean, we see it in the, like his poker style, but also like the way he always like takes insurance whenever he's a big pot. He's like, he's kind of like scared. So like the, the fact that he doesn't gamble big in high stakes room, he can always just say like, Oh, you know, it's, 
you know, there's there's a lot of different things that you can say say to justify that. I think there is. I think some small part of him does believe that he might not be the greatest poker player to ever exist. I think it's a small part, but I think that's there. And he can. It's so much easier to look at the 15 World Series of Poker bracelets and this sort of cherry picked collection of of tournament successes that he has to to be like I'm, I'm the best of all time i've done it in all the games and blah 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 blah. i think it's it's you know he, cognitive dissonance is not a thing to phil helmuth everything that sort of con, like con, contrast or everything that sort of contradicts his claim like he can always find a way to negotiate his way out of like that being evidence that he's not the goat you're right you know so there's i'm sorry i, I really want to say a couple things here too like there's so many ways you can frame if you want to make your case for being the goat right for most of my career i was the all-time money leader in tournament poker right Bryn kenny's number one right now so Bryn kenny's won more money than anybody in turn is he the best maybe but is that evidence that he's the best because he won one tournament which was like you know 15 or 20 million like what we what, what's so hard for people to understand about poker. And I learned this after doing the Doug match uh, is how much variance plays a role and how easily obsessed people are and results oriented they are, um, which uh, there's one of the hands that I wanted to get to on that note, but, but also uh, the video that I shot today, what's interesting about Phil is he chastises and calls you an idiot for the most ABC standard plays like imaginable, like 300 big blinds deep. You open King nine of diamonds, the big blind three bets, so you just have like really only one option. There's really no four bets. I mean, you could, but GTO is like going to just flat here 100% of the time. There's no folds with King nine off. I mean, with King nine suited, it's just not, not a thing. Same with six, four suited and same with like, you know, anything like that, very, very deep, but he goes ballistic in those spots. And I said this in the video, part of the reason is he's played tournaments all his life, which is typically going to be 40 big blinds or less, right? So that's where his mindset comes from. So if you're playing off 40 big blinds, you can't really be calling a lot of three bets you know, big three bets with marginal hands. Right. So he extrapolates from that and saying like, well, you know, I wouldn't do this to 300 big blinds and looks at the situations as though they're the same. Right. So if you, if you shouldn't do it off of 40, right. Where you shouldn't call 10 X when you have 40 big blinds with King nine, maybe, and I'm not saying that's true, then you definitely shouldn't, you know, if you're 300 or 400. So he goes crazy and calls you an idiot and gets mad about the stuff that like the top 10,000, the top 10,000 no limit hold'em players in the world would all say is completely standard. Yeah. Not, not thousand, not hundred, 10,000 would all be like, duh. It's just like, it's just so strange. The ones that he picks, you know, like what the fuck this fucking idiot calls me with King nine of diamonds. I'm like, yes, Phil, it's fucking heads up. What, what do you think this is? You think I'm like under the gun and fucking under the gun plus one and just got in 300 big blinds with King nine. It's so goofy. So you mentioned the four things that he wanted to rant about. He started off talking about the greatest tournament poker player ever of all time. And, and he claimed that Jason Kuhn and Doyle both said it was Phil. And then he called you a liar uh, because you said that he was a lifetime loser in high roller events and claimed he was a $1.5 million winner. So I mean, that, that's not quite true either because what I said, because he made a claim. Okay. He used the term I'm crushing high rollers. Okay. He's played like not many. Right. And you know, maybe he's up one or one and a half, but like when you think about it, he, he cashed in a, in a one drop, which is a 1 million buy-in. So he won like 1.6 in that. Right. And then you play some hundred K's and stuff. Okay. So, so, but the, the idea that he's crushing, right. He's never had a single top three finish in a 25 K no limit or above. Right. So what I said was, is you're not crushing and I will bet you, and I will lay you two to one that you can't beat these guys, you know, over a sample size of 50 events. But he took offense to the idea that I, I suggested he was a loser. What I said, I, I was challenging his claim because he's not, cru is that crushing by any winning like one buy-in? Like winning one buy-in? Like his ROI, he doesn't, I'm not sure if he understands how ROI works. But if you look at his ROI, I would bet that his ROI is losing in high rolls for sure, right? Because if you looked at the 1 million and you think of that as plus 1.6, that's one plus 1 1.6 buy-ins, right? So then if he plays two 25Ks and doesn't cash, he's minus 0.4 of a buy-in. Like ROI doesn't work just simply based on like, I bought in for a million and I cashed for 1 million. So I'm up a million. I'm crushing these things, you know? Daniel, he invented ROI. Come on. What are you talking yeah, about? He might have, yeah. Uh, then he goes on and he wants to talk about the greatest poker player of all time. And he cited uh, Doyle and Johnny Chan and himself and a quote, a few others as people who could be the goat. And he's sticking the needle in, I think. And, he's, and then he looks at you and he says, listen, Daniel, in 10 years, it might be you. 
<laughs> or, all right, here's the thing. So this whole GOAT conversation is so silly, right? Because when you look at poker, right? Because we talked about variance in poker. You can look and say, are we going to base it off of results, right? Which like things happen in tournaments. Or are we going to base it on what people know, right? Like people who play, right? So for example, in the high stakes, you know, Bobby's room, everyone knows David Oppenheim is a crusher. It doesn't matter how much he wins. doesn't matter how much he loses. It doesn't matter what a WSOP resume looks like. This guy's a killer. And when people sit down with him, you know, they fear him. Same with Phil Ivey and the like, right? Phil attaches a lot of meaning to results as evidence, right? Like that's, that's how he defines the go, like what has happened in the past. So what is the greatest of all time mean? I guess it depends how you define it. It's a silly conversation. We've had it a bunch, but is it like the player who was at the top for the longest period? Or is it the player who's the best now? I think they're, I don't think, I don't think of the greatest of all time as someone that's the best. Now I watched a really great Bobby Fisher video just the other day, actually, where Bobby Fisher just yesterday actually was talking about theory. And he was talking about like, someone asked him, are you the greatest ever? And he's like, well, that's, you know, a messed up question. He's like, when I started playing, like I had more knowledge of theory that existed than people a hundred years before me. Right. And they were great players, but of course I'll be better than them because I'm equipped with more theory, which is true in poker. Right. So in 10 years from now, the top players, this isn't arguable. The top players in 10 years will be better than the top players now because we continually improve to a point where we're better. So when you look at eras, you say, okay, well, this person was like a killer in their era, but then you have to be careful of saying, well, that person, you know, would beat the players of today, you know? So like, and that, what he really talks about is skill and creativity versus memorization. It was so interesting because I was really thinking poker versus memorization planning. And that's essentially what, you know, great poker players of, of today do. They, they focus less on, you know, sort of talent and skill and more on hard work and just downloading all the theory. Yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting side topic, but uh, but to pick up on that, yeah, because it's true because um, the way that people have gotten good at poker in the last twenty years has really changed, right? Like when we all started playing poker, you know, you you know, there was a couple books that existed. There were some theories you could add, go on on the internet and ask a few people, but mostly you just kind of had to play poker. And then maybe you talked about poker with your friends and like, I played this hand and here's what we did. And you know, oh, I think you could play this street differently. You could made more money. You could have could have folded this hand. But nobody really knew the answer. And then we sort of got involved. Mathematics started to come in in the early theories of online poker. You know, we started talking about things like combos and and people started running simulations and preflop. And we started to get a better, better, a little bit better understanding. We started getting getting closer to the understanding of like how to play poker properly. But we're still really far from it in the 2000s, right? And if you, you can see that because if any... Poker Pro from 2021 goes back and looks at a hand from like 2008. They're just laughing their faces off because it's just a disaster. <laughs> and then after a while, we start getting actual real quote unquote GTO solutions, which aren't really GTO, but like we start getting things like, you know, shove or fold at so many big blinds. We know that, you know, if somebody follows a strategy, they're, they're at least doing okay. It's not the perfect strategy, but they're close. And then we start entering the solver area era where we actually can just input flops and input ranges and input bet sizes. And then we know basically what the correct answer is for the situation. And so when you, you, when you migrate to that point, now it is more about memorization. It's, it's a, the way that you study is that you just have to to, to look at all of these flops and see what do I do in all these flops and what does the other guy do in all these flops and all these runouts and you'll never be able to put all of these flops into your brain because we're just human we're not going to be able to do that but the sort of the more kind of trends and understanding of what board certain board textures look like and the way behaviors look and bet sizes look like it is it is just more study and like what do these things look like over time as opposed to the old way we used to get better at poker which is like oh these guys do this so if we do this then then we win yeah no you're right uh, to piggyback that like the old days like you're right it was like okay so this guy's doing this so i will do that right today as you said you know and i went down this rabbit hole of course with you know studying you know solvers and essentially what you have is you have you know, and AI is the future. Like AI can play better poker than people, period. Same with that game, you know, Go or Alpha Go or whatever. So essentially what you have with solvers is you have two AIs playing against each other at an optimal level. And then we have us humans who are like, all right, let me ask this, you know, ask these computers some questions. Like, what do they like to do here? And like you said, Terrence, they start, you start to notice like, okay, on paired boards, it wants the smaller size more often than not. 
right? And then you start to just use that as a little bit more memorization. Then you're like, okay, in this spot, because it has the button and range advantage, it wants me to bet really big on these low boards and stuff like that. So, and how do you get that into your brain? You get that through study. And that's what I was doing. I was studying and then you bucket like all kinds of board textures. Like, is there a difference between, you know, queen six deuce and, uh, you know, like nine, six, five, right? In terms of what your sizing should be. And absolutely the solvers is what we learn from and, uh, you know, use to improve our game. And people are just gonna find better and better and more efficient ways to do that uh, as we get better. And, you know, they'll learn how to even, uh, see that thing is like, just because people are learning how to play game theory doesn't mean they've abandoned exploitative poker. This match, I was using game theory to exploit. Like I wasn't playing at all as though I would have played against somebody who's playing game theory optimal. Like all the folds I was able to make, those are not folds you can make you know, at a game theory optimal level, those are exploitative folds. I definitely took the exploit too far when he was short stacked, both when he was and both when I was. But aside from that, like in the first half of the match, it went exactly as I expected, you know, complete domination in every way, get him down to 3K. And then I made the mistake of saying to myself, all right, I played prevent defense way too early. Like I should have just put him away and I didn't. And that was, uh, you know, I mean, then of course I just ran bad and lost every hand on the river, but, um, but I did not, I mean, I approached it with game theory, fundament, fundamentals and bet sizing, things like that. But the whole approach was exploiting his weaknesses. Uh, so he goes on. We'll just finish up here with some of this pre-match stuff. He, he continues, um, Daniel, you sit there and listen to him and you let him, you know, you let him have his, his uh, uh, you know, peacocking or whatever you want to call it. And then sits down and he goes, what do you have to say, Daniel? And the funny yeah. part is that, you start to talk and he just interrupts you. And Well, that's the thing, right? So here's what he says before. He's like, listen, let me talk and don't interrupt me, okay? Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, Phil. I sit quiet. I don't stay a word. Then he says, it's your turn to talk. I say one sentence and he jumps right in. He does this every time. He thinks I interrupt him, right? But every single time he's ever asked of me, he said, don't interrupt me. I never do. And then he says, what's your take? And he interrupts me within the first five seconds. Every time. <laughs> not help it. It's great. And, and he says, uh, so you start to say you've never had a top three finish in a 20, 25K no limit hold'em tournament or higher. And he interrupts you and calls you a liar. And, and you know, you say, uh, oh, I don't think you say I'll bet you at that point. But um, he, go, he follows it up and he doesn't really ever say I have a top three finish in a 25K no limit because he probably doesn't. And, you know, but he still calls you a liar, but he, but he doesn't show any proof that you're lying, right? Um, and then he goes off on Nick. He's, he looks at Nick. I got a bone to pick with you. And, and he's saying during his uh, heads up dual match with uh, Esfandiari, he says, I, uh, I limped with uh, one big blind with King 10, Antonio raised with King Queen, and I folded. And then I limped with King Jack for one big blind, and Antonio raised with King Queen, and I folded. And, and he gets up and, uh, you know, he, he does this, this rant. And Ross, have you got the clip? What does that tell you? To me, that's apex predator shit, bro. I can save one big blind with King 10 against King Jack. I can save one big blind, you know, in these two amazing spots. And then I call off 44 big blinds with, you didn't like any of those plays. And to me, this is white magic, apex predator shit, King Kong shit. What do you have to say? <laughs> what do you have to say? What do you have to say is just so great. I mean, what could you say? <laughs> So here's the the best part is Nick calls him on it. He says, uh, Phil, I don't think you ever limped with King Jack for one big blind and then folded for King Queen. He goes, I did. I did. And Daniel, you go, I'll bet you $100,000 that didn't happen. And uh, he just, he, you know, he, he won't bet because, and then he goes, oh, maybe I misspoke. <laughs> yeah, this is it. This is what he does. He's, you know, what he was trying to claim and he, maybe he was just wording it wrong for what he was trying to say. But like, you know, he was saying like, he saved one big blind as though the big blind min raised, yeah. right? So yeah. he's playing, which, which Antonio would never do. So it made right, sense. I was, so that's why I was like, this never happened because Antonio yeah. never. You didn't limp for one big blind, and then Antonio made it two big blinds. Like that never happened. Yeah, I think you did fold King Jack or King Nine or something, Queen Jack or something like that. Um, you know, a couple times, but like, you know, and I don't know. Yeah, it was it. But the way he was phrasing it, once again, when he says things, I hold him to what he actually says, and then it's like, oh, you know. Uh, yeah, maybe that wasn't real. <laughs> well, 12 seconds earlier, he's calling you a liar. And then all of a sudden, yeah. I messed up, right? <laughs> but see, that's the thing, because he didn't hear what I said. He called me a liar, because I, but I said, you haven't had a top three finish in a 25K no-limit tournament. 
right? And he's thinking, I finished second in a 25K World Series event. That was a mixed game event. Because so he didn't hear the part. You like, that's just, you know, one of the, the things about listening. Often, <laughs> like, I mean, I tweet something, like, I don't know, sidebar, but I tweeted something just yesterday. No malicious intent whatsoever. And uh, I actually said, you know, something to the, in, the, in regards to nu- nutrition. I said, basically, I was saying, you know, in most cases, it, uh, you know, it, it can, okay, what I say, like eating a healthier diet um, could prevent in some, in most cases, you know, worsening health conditions. That's it. But then I got a whole bunch of shit where people say, oh, you know, but I'm like, did you read what I wrote? I didn't say that people that have heart conditions or whatever should fucking throw their pills away or they should, you know, oh, if they only eat good, I wasn't talking about mental health issues. I, it was just, it's just so crazy how people, whether it's live or whether it's on the internet and social media, you, re, you I reread it four times. I'm like, I'm not, I didn't say anything that you're claiming I said, and it's right there in plain fucking ink. And Phil does that a lot. And he did that in this case when I specifically said 25K no limit hold'em tournament. He's never had a top three in his entire life. Like that's a and long time. On it and he wouldn't bet. And this is what's great about poker players, right? Like when you're in a group of poker players or even one or two, like if you say something, you either ha- and somebody calls you on it and says, I'll bet you that that didn't happen or I bet you you're wrong. You either have to say, okay, I'm not going to bet because I'm not sure or you're going to, you're, or you bet. And, and this, I love this, you know, mechanism that poker players have of, you know, m- making sure what you say is right instead of just, you know, spouting off like Phil does. Well, most people don't with Phil. They don't hold him. I always do. Every time Phil says something that's not true, I go, I'll bet you, I'll bet you, I'll bet you, I'll bet you. And then he backtracks, right? Cause like you said, you have two choices, either, either put the money up or admit that you're not sure. Cause if you're sure it's free money, come get it. <laughs> so yeah. good. And I love that he called you the politician. Like that's your new nickname for sure. The politician. <laughs> oh my God. I'd be yeah, canceled I'm, a long time ago. Yeah. I was going to say like, I, I can't, I mean, you're not the last poker player who would get elected, but you're fairly far down the list. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, and then he says, shut the fuck up, Daniel. So he basically gets upset because you're calling him on it and won't, and he won't back it up. And then he says, shut the fuck up. And uh, he's just like so defensive, right? Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, anyways, uh, let's get on to the match. So, um, you know, a, a couple of hands. First of all, before we start on that, what is with Phil and eating this disgusting <laughs> food that he's and this maybe the food isn't disgusting the way he eats it a is disgusting and why are you doing it on a stream while you're playing i was ahead? telling him bro i said like there's no way you can look cool eating you know oh. food at a poker table and like i think nick and ali it's like maybe like they're disgusted but it's their favorite part of the entire show i think because they just like laugh because it's like the combination of food that he often puts in his mouth it's like such a bizarre like when you go like chicken sandwich with sour patch kids to to sweet and sour dumplings that are sushi it's like chicken sandwich sushi and sour patch kids think of those as a combo and you would like never put that together but like and the order like before with the burger that was the really crazy part he takes a bite of burger chases <laughs> you know candy and is chewing burger with candy it's yeah. like I laugh. I mean, I love it. It's, it's, you know, that, I think a lot of people it's, I'm glad that they get it on camera because it's, it's something to see. And the, the size of the bag of Sour Patch Kids, like, where do you, get, that's from Costco. Well, that was a gift from uh, somebody on set where they, because if you see, if you look at the, the, the box, it actually said the uh, poker brat mix. So it oh. was like right on the box, like, uh, like it looked like it was actually, you know, a real product. So he loves that. His name freaking on a product. He's like, Oh, he's all about it. That was a five pound bag five pounds of sour patch kids how That's wild. a lot of it's sugar so much sugar like he ate five thousand calories sitting there for sure I and mean, he's got the shirt on that you know the shirt on that's like just a little bit too small for you in length yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's got the track pants on and his guts kind of hanging out and his shirt doesn't <laughs> cover up his gut and he's just kind of like there's gonna be a lot of people watching this film. <laughs> like, yeah. i don't care but oh man it's a great rivalry phil yeah. versus shirts <laughs> the shirts are not winning at this point i don't know but um okay so uh back to and oh and then so first of all like uh the guy do you remember the salad fingers tweet from a couple of years ago the world series of poker there's somebody who took a video of a guy eating <laughs> a salad with his fingers wasn't it kelly yeah yes, not just kelly. not just any guy it was kelly <laughs> it, was, it was a friend of ours but <laughs> 
this is exactly what Phil's doing, right? Like he's got, he's got his sandwich and then there's like gunk all over the cards. And I think you said something like, what's on these cards? Are they marked or something? And no, it's like, that's a turkey or whatever he's eating. <laughs> yeah, he noticed the mark and I was like, what is, and then he, then he mentioned that it might've been his food. Cause it wasn't <laughs> mine. I, I, I need, I didn't eat anything. <laughs> This is, I mean, we're, it's so entertaining before we even get to the poker. It's just so much fun to watch. And, and you know what, here's this on a serious note, the poker go stream struggled. Like they, it bounced around and Daniel, you wouldn't have seen this, but you know, it would, for the first couple of hours, <clears throat> it would just bounce, bounce back and forth between 15 seconds and go. And it was really getting hard. It was really work. unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, listen, obviously, and there's no excuse. It's unfortunate because obviously it's a big marquee event and there was a lot of eyeballs watching this thing. And I don't know if that had an effect or not but uh yeah i mean obviously everybody internally is really pissed off when technical issues like that happen like i know you know i've had issues like that happen you know sometimes you're an online poker thing sites crash or when i had my thing you know my uh sold package pieces you know shit happens with computers that's partly why i have like zero patience for that you know like watching it like that would have been you know very very frustrating and i get that and i you know it's, it's yeah it was really unfortunate and hopefully for the next match um they will have that ironed out which we're going to announce we're going to announce actually this will this will be up I think the same day. I'm going again on the No Gamble No Future podcast with Phil Helmuth. So Brent and uh you well, know don't Brent interrupt and, them. Just just make sure don't interrupt them. Yeah. Brent and you, Platt will just do what they did last time and just kind of watch cuz you know once we go we go and there's really no need for questions. This will be great. <clears throat> Looking forward to that. Um all right, so on to the match. Uh, so the stacks start really deep, right? I think you want to, I think you start, you know, 300 big blinds deep. 500. Or sort of 500. And, um, you know, you really was sort of a, a master class of picking them apart slowly and slowly and slowly and wearing them down. Now, he didn't pick up a whole ton of hands early. So, <clears throat> you know, it was hard for him to play the way Phil does, right? He waits and waits and waits for hand and then takes a stand or plays it, you know, in some fashion that he can win some chips. Um, but he didn't really pick up a whole lot early. But, Again, you know, I don't know that you picked up a ton of hands either. You picked up aces and won like the blinds a couple of times. It wasn't like you were, you know, had the deck or whatever. I think you probably flopped a couple of hands, but. Well, yeah, what you're really pointing to is the fact that like, so if you look at the match, the pot size when he's in position is much smaller than when I am. And obviously when you're in position is when you make the most money. So he never won. Like he didn't win throughout the entire match. A single, like if you can think of one, not one single hand did he win a substantial pot that didn't include me betting and then him hitting the river, right? Like I bet flop, I bet turn, he calls, he calls, he hits the river or something like that. There was not a single hand where he won this big pot where he bet 5K on the river or 6K and I you know, paid it off and he won or, or he bluffed a big pot or anything like that. Not a single one. He was somewhat handcuffed during you know, the deep stack play because his fundamental understanding of that, he doesn't play it a lot, right? He doesn't play that deep that much. He likes to play short stack. He might say he likes it, but he's not very good at it, you know? So, because, you know, his strategy going in is not, like, there is a limping strategy that can be good, but it's not 90%, you know? That's just too much because you're just giving up way too much value. So when he would pick up hands and he does his limp, you know, with ace-king, okay? And then I have, like, you know, 10-8 offsuit in the big blind. I check back, Right? Now I would call a raise with that hand always. So then the pot would be, you know, five big blinds. Now it's only two, you know, then on the flop. Now there's only two chips in the pot. Okay. So now here's the problem of what he, he can't do. Part of what you want to do from a game theory perspective is you want to vary your C betting sizes. Sometimes you want to bet about quarter pot, 30%, you know, two thirds, sometimes full pot. He can't by lo- but the rules don't allow because there's two chips in the pot. The minimum bet is one. So you have to bet 50% continuation so here's the pro here's the easy part for me against the side because like normally against smaller sizes you have to peel more right but because he's betting big if you will because 50 50 percent pot is quite big in this spot it allows the big blind to just fold and it's fine like theoretically it doesn't cost me much like if i don't flop anything i can just you know check and fold and one other important thing that people don't understand about fighting for these pots because people are like dude you should have got more aggressive on these flops and da 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 and check what they don't understand is fundamentally when somebody limps 90% of the time and you check the big blind, their range is significantly stronger than yours because they have all their aces, kings, queens, ace, king, ace, queen suited. You're raising a bunch of those when they limp. So my range is much weaker, which in turn, when that's the case, when my range is weaker, that means I should defer to the stronger range and usually check 
right? Not just try to steal, like when he has way more good hands than I do. That's kind of how poker works. Like, it's not how old people think, you know, as Terrence referenced earlier, but today people think of like, all right, well, not just what do I have, but like, well, who has the stronger range now? And when someone limps every single hand against you and you are raising, you know, with your good hands for the most part, then you're at a range disadvantage. So that allows you to just keep the pot small. You lose the big blind, which is fine because listen, like I said, if I have all these hands that I have 10, eight and Jack nine and seven, eight that are all calling two and a half. Now I don't even have to, I save all those chips. So I only have to continue after the flop when I have something pretty good. And theoretically that's printing EV just on that alone. Like if we just play that alone and he does that and he never adjusted, it, you, you couldn't really lose, you know, that deep. It's just no way. So you whittle him down and he starts to get really upset about, um, you know, the way the match is going for sure. And you can see him he's sort of the, you know, his body language and he's like holding this, you know, the way the Phil does, it's, it's great TV again. Um, and this hand comes up and I want to bring this one up and I know you did talk about it, by the way, for anybody who wants to see Daniel break down a few of the hands, uh, we'll talk a little bit about them here, but he, I think Daniel, you go into great detail in another video on your channel on your YouTube channel. So check that out. Um, so this is the um, eight, six of hearts hand, you and the button. Uh, Phil has ace, eight off suit in the big blind. Um, you raise the button, it's totally standard with the eight, six of, eight, six of hearts, you're really deep. Uh, Phil three bets uh, with the ace, eight off, you call. Uh, the flop comes king, six, five, heart with two hearts. So you have middle pair, backdoor straight draw and a flush draw. And Phil bets, you call. The turn is a nine. Um, he bets again. So you now have a straight draw, a flush draw, and a third pair. You call. Pretty good place to just flat. You, you raise it's, you know, you, tough spot. So, um, and the river is a seven. So you make a one card straight with your eight. So again, it's king, six, five, nine, seven. The flush doesn't get there. You have the straight, one card straight. Phil also has the one card straight. He's backed into it with the ace eight. And he bets and you call because, you know, is he going to call? What's he going to call with if you raise in that spot? Um, and um, he, he starts to get really upset. And, and he's, he's furious that you would call him with the eight, six of hearts when you're that deep. And to me, you know, without getting you know, the hand is what, again, if you want to hear about Daniel's thoughts on the hand, you can go check that out. But this is the interesting thing here for me is when he does get upset and we talk a lot about is Phil putting on a show but if he, and he does this, right? He'll do this to amateur players. You're terrible. I can't believe you played the hand that way. And sometimes we think that's Phil trying to, to get that amateur player to play the way he wants to, the way he's going to berate him into playing the way he wants to. But I don't know that it really is him consciously thinking that because he's doing it to you right here. Like he's furious with you for calling. And is it going to change the way you play because Phil gets mad at you? No. And I just found that interesting. I don't know what you thought about that, Daniel. Yeah, no. So again, I do touch on this on the video, but it's important because like we sort of touched on this earlier as well about like he gets upset about the most standard basic plays, right? But here's how he thinks. Like I said, you know, he comes from the mindset of like 40 big blind poker, right? Which means, you know, you have to play a little more carefully. And this is 300 big blinds deep. You know, I have 47K, the blind big blind is 150, right? So I make a two and a half X, he makes it 10 X. Again, totally standard, but here's what's happening in his brain. He's like, I'm Phil Hellmuth. I don't three bet that often, right? So they should fold when I three bet because it's me, right? So they should overfold. So he wants his opponents to exploit the other way. He wants his opponents to say, listen, listen, I played so tight. It's the first button I opened and blah, blah, blah. And you three re-raised me, right? So he's essentially saying to you, or trying to, that I'm playing so tight that when I three bet, you should fold with six, eight of hearts. As though that's relevant, because frankly, his range there is far less relevant to me when I have a hand like six, eight suited, right? Because six, eight suited, 300 big blinds deeps is a fantastic hand to hit a flop with. And uh, frankly, if he has a strong range, that's that's kind of good for me. I'm, I'm okay with that because I'm playing a hand that's, you know, looking to, you know, win some, uh, you know, big big equity on, on turns and rivers. But no, it's frustration for him. And but like... He makes a play because ace eight offsuit. I mean, 300 big blinds deep. Really, it's not a, it's not really that good of a three betting hand, to be honest with you. It's actually in most charts you'll see when you play like 100 big blinds or deeper, ace eight offsuit is a flat, like always. 
So there are some three bets with ace five, with ace nine, with ace 10, but like ace eight typically is what solvers like to just flat with. He likes to three bet with it. It's fine. I don't think it's horrible or whatever, but the idea or the audacity for him to like freak out because somebody called him with a very good hand, six, eight of hearts. The other one, again, same situation. I The, the hands I talked about are only um, like three hands where he re-raised preflop because he just doesn't do that very often. But in each one, I had a hand where it was king, nine of diamonds, uh, six, four diamonds and, you know, the six, eight of hearts or something like that. Like all very basic standard hands. But those are the ones, like I said, he gets the most upset about. And uh, it comes from this entitlement idea that like, don't they know I'm playing really, really tight? This should work. He's like, this should work. I three bet him. He should fold because I've been, you know, I did everything right in his mind. But because he doesn't understand the fundamental nature of 300 big blind poker. Like in 300 big blind poker, you're supposed to defend the button more, significantly more than 100 and way more than like 40 big blinds. And, and he's been doing this for, I mean, basically as long as televised poker has existed. Um, cause you know, we were watching him do this in mid, early, mid two thousands, do this kind of idea that, um, you know, the, exactly what you're saying is that I, I, I so rarely bluff, like they should just always fold when I, when I three bet, um, we, we've seen it for throughout his entire career that, that he gets offended when people look him up light. And I wondered, my question to you, Daniel is, is this, I mean, I, I know you, it's not good to talk about strategy when there's, there's another match coming, but I feel like they'll never adjust anyway. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, what I want to ask you is like, Daniel had a range sheet that he was showing Phil. Yeah. And, oh, here's, here's my range, Phil. Guess what? I know, I know if this was like the Doug match, I, I'd feel bad about asking Daniel because Daniel would just like not answer me. But like if there was an exploit that he found out of Doug, because like Doug actually would take advantage of the fact that Daniel's trying to exploit him, but Phil won't. But like he's so... The, you know, we'll get to the, the, the river hands later. It seems like he's so um, under bluffs on rivers, but so much more on earlier streets. Is that like an accurate thing to say? That's what um, he's been doing for 30 years. Yeah. He plays a very aggressive game. Well, I, he plays a lot of hands pre-flop, but doesn't play them aggressively. But he's very aggressive with, with flop stabs, right? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes falls up unturned. But no, everything you say is obviously right. And I think he knows that people know that. But, uh, you know, he believes in what he does and thinks the system works. Um, but I don't. <laughs> I, I mean, like, one of, the, one of the more funny, frustrating things for me is the narrative about this match. Because I did make one very big mistake late. I miscount Either the graphic was wrong or I miscounted my chips by folding this Jack-10 late. But um, what's frustrating about it, the narrative is, like, for all intents and purposes, this match, like, when we were deep, I dominated. Then when he started winning hands... He was hitting rivers and not getting paid. So he was like drawing out. He made like a, you know, backdoor straight when I have King Deuce of clubs. He made eights and tens when I had an ace. He made, um, you know, another like queen 10 straight when I had the King Deuce of clubs and then another, just like a whole, oh, then the King nine of diamonds versus nine, six of hearts. I flop a King. I go bet, bet, bet. So these big pots, he hit the river, but he didn't get paid on the river. Like he didn't get value on the river. So the narrative was like, oh, you know, Daniel, the, dominate him in the first half and then phil just like played just dominate him in the second i'm like actually i printed sklensky bucks if you will <laughs> even in the second part it wasn't the mistakes i made happened late in the match where i took i thought it was like uh he made a flush or something and you you even made a comment on yeah it. but i would have bet that anyway that okay. it's true that a flush did hit but I, I mean luckily for me but i really didn't see the heart but I, that was the king nine hand where he had six nine of hearts and he hit a flush i would have bet small blocker bet anyway with the king, I was trying to target a queen or a 10 anyways, or a worse king. So I would have bet that anyway. Like I thought about that, but no question late. Like I actually, uh, like I said, I, I took the exploit too far because he plays short stacks and everything like conservatively. Right. So I took exploits too far, both when he was short and both when I was short, you know, in retrospect, I wouldn't do that. So the Jack 10, like I thought I had like nine or 10 big blinds left and he jammed and that's fine to fold, but apparently I had a lot less or I'm not sure if that's true, but I guess, you know, people are saying like, I heard people talking about it and like, it's crazy to me that the narrative of the match is like, I folded Jack 10 incorrectly. And it's like the other 300 hands didn't happen. You know what I mean? Cause like the whole thing, like I actually thought my, like the best part of like the decisions I made happened when he started hitting a lot of rivers. 
Cause I wasn't like getting, I wasn't getting stacked in these spots. I wasn't losing any chips on the river. Like you flop came King Jack six. He opened the button. I call with King four. You know, I check call the flop turns a deuce. I check fold the turn It's King Jack, you know, like every one of these hands where he hit, like even the King deuce of clubs, I checked that one back when he hit backdoor straight and I had Kings in a flush draw and he hit, you know, runner, runner, six outs. So he had like a five out or a six, just a whole bunch of those hands. But like, there was that's what I'm saying throughout this match. There was no hands where he ran this really big bluff, you know, or, you know, I uh, paid him off in this spot where he like won a mountain of chips. There was like, it never happened. The only hands he won of substance were I was betting and then he needed to catch a card and then he caught the card. <laughs> like I, I thought I played that extremely well. And if, you know, people were being objective, the frustrating thing is people didn't watch it and say, oh my God, he fucking owned you, bro. Phil's your daddy. Phil fucking crushed you, bro. <laughs> like, it's tough, because when you know po- there's so much variance in poker, and you're a pro, like, you see that, and you just have to giggle and laugh, but, like, it can be annoying after a while. How stupid. It, rem- it just it just basically taught me how, like, incredibly stupid people can be. So, two things I want to bring up, or two hands I want to bring up, <clears throat> because the whole poker world is like, what the hell, Phil? So, he folds um, King nine on the king queen jack jack board that you bet i think you put them all in i want to say or he was short at the time anyway and yeah it's king you know it's king queen of spades or king queen jack of spades on the flop so it's there's a royal out there i think it's a red jack on the turn so the flush doesn't get there you have i don't know some nine high nine five off okay. yeah you have full bluff and he just folds and gets mad um and then he picks up uh, the queen six of clubs, you have the 10, five of clubs, you raise, he calls, it comes two, three, four with two clubs. You have the open ender and the flush draw and he has the over flush draw. And so, and then there's the other hand on the, on the river where the poker world was like, what the hell you, you shove. And he open folds the queen Jack suited with that was just pre-flop. A, yeah. Pre-flop. And, yeah. and people so you just, just you, like, yeah, you just went over like five hands or so let's stack one at a time. Um, first right. of all, Let's so the, the the one that was really frustrating for me was the 10 five of clubs because I okay. was like purposefully not letting him double up, you know. I wasn't planning on giving him a courtesy double up. So I was gonna grind him and leave him short. That was my that was my you know intention because I know he's looking for a hand, he's gonna be conservative in this regard, you know, and try to like, you know, get it in good. So I wasn't gonna allow that to happen. Now I min raise, he calls, it comes deuce three, four with two clubs. I have the 10 five of clubs. He checks, I bet, I bet, quarter pot, he goes all in for like not much more, right? And I'm like, this sucks. And you didn't even want to call. You were like, no. oh. I'm like, yeah, because I know he's not bluffing, right? There's no bluff here. And his bluffs like could have me crushed like he did with the queen six of clubs, as it turns out. But like, obviously I have a hand that in no fucking way can you actually fold. But I really did want to because like that was part of my strategy was not to just like get it in with them when he wants to play a big pot and he short stacked. But that hand just felt too good. And that was frustrating because, like I said, I was in complete control until we had that. That was his first all in. He won that. And then from there, um, you know, he started to really catch a lot of hands. So to take those two hands where the whole poker world is like, what the hell are you doing, Phil? It doesn't make any sense. And then so he he gets he gives up the uh, the top pair to you and then he gets you in a bad spot. And then he folds the queen check and he gets you in a bad spot because he waits till he's got two nines and you have the six, seven hearts and he holds. And I can see Phil thinking, see, I threw away those, those spots where everybody else in the world would have called. And look, I ended up with two nines, two hands later or whatever it was. And it's just like, well, yeah, you did Phil, but you might not have picked up those two nines, two hands later. Like, you know, it's just the way it turns out. Right. It's, so it's sort of this, um, you know, uh, reinforcement by, the fact that he did pick up those hands now, which is great because he'll keep doing it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, you had him 97,000 to 3000 and uh, you know, just complete dominating situation. And then he, he runs back and I don't know what you thought about his play after that. And after you got sort of got even Daniel, but it, it looked, you know, like you said, he was hitting some hands for sure, but Phil, I don't know. What did you think of Phil's play after, after he got even? Well, really, I mean, like like I said, it was all the key hands were spots where I was betting, he was drawing, and then he hit. You know, like there was nothing specific. I think what he did well, uh, if anything, as, was at the very end. Once I got short, he started to up his aggression level when I got really, really short. And he started to like play a little bit better there. But overall, like I didn't think there was anything he did. Like, no, not really. Because like, again, fundamentally, the way he constructs his ranges across the board, 
are just really exploitable. You know, like his range construction for his three bets, his range construction for his turn barrels, they're just not balanced. They're usually weighted one way or the other. His check his raises size. on the flop. Huh? His sizing too, I think you were talking about. Well, his sizing, yeah. His sizing's a, you know, he, listen, he, he's not studied, you know, the fundamentals of the game in, in that regard. So he's not going to know all this stuff and you can't expect him to, right? Unless he like was copying other people, which he won't do because as Terrence said, you know, if he's winning, you know, and he's whatever he's won, like a bunch of these little, ma- of these sit and goes, he thinks, you know, he doesn't separate result from EV, right? He sees result win, I won. That's all that matters. And many people in my YouTube comments say, that's all that matters. It's who wins? I'm like, okay, you, whatever you say, you know, doesn't matter how it happened, whatever. It's one of the few endeavors you can watch where it's not simply like Pete Sampras against Agassi. Well, Sampras won, you know, you got to give him credit, right? This, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's not, it's not like a level playing field in that regard because, you know, you can't control what cards come. And I mean, anybody who watched the match with like, whatever, I mean, it was pretty, like, here's the problem. I made a bunch of side bets. The people who bet against me getting 150 watched the match that I lost and said, no, thank you. Oh, going forward. They don't want, they won't, they won't bet me anymore. These are, I don't even want to name them because it's like, it seems a little nitty, but they're like, they watched it and they're like, honestly, I didn't realize how big your edge was, you know, in the deep stack play. So like three to two isn't enough for them. Like I'm laying a dollar 50. They didn't, they didn't want it anymore based on, you know, watching it. So it's like, the reality of like, when it comes to money, people are like, all right, I don't want out. But then the narrative is, you know, well, Daniel folded fucking Jack 10. Incorrectly. Well, I mean, that's because the narrative is, is driven by people who make comments on your YouTube channel and on Twitter. Whereas the people who are betting 150 are betting real money. They're actual professional poker players and gamblers. And they realize that you were a bigger than three to two favorite. I mean, like the thing is we can, we can, you know, dwell on the fact that he, you know, is, you know, ran extremely, you know, to be, to, to understate it, to extremely good to win, win this match. But like, think like this is, this is what causes poker to exist. Cause if, if stuff like this didn't happen, like we, we, we would not be podcasting right now because poker would not be a game. If the, if the worst player, the guy with whatever it is, 30% equity didn't win a lot of the time, then we wouldn't have a game. I mean, this is it. Totally like, agree. The, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously it makes it epic, right? Because if I just would have won, you know, 97-3, win the all-in, it's like, all right, well, big deal. The favorite won, you know, move on, no big deal. But this ends up being like pretty fucking epic, right? The guy had three fucking chips, 3K, and came back and won the thing, right? And it's cool because um, the narrative isn't, the story's not over yet, right? So now there is going to be a round two and likely a round three, you know? So, uh so yeah, if you I win, mean, you think he'll he'll agree. If you win game two, you think he'll. Question to you. Let me get to that first. Yeah. Well, don't steal that, Terrence. Okay. Uh, how many times in a hundred do you think Phil Helmuth wins uh, at the start of the hand where Daniel has ninety-seven thousand and he has three thousand? How many times in a hundred does he come back? I mean, like it's like the thing is, a lot of those situations are are, are automatic and the blinds are really big, so it can't be like much worse than two percent, right? Like that's the thing is is that like it's definitely not 3% because he plays a short stack so badly, but it's hard for it to be like 1%. It's hard, hard, it's hard for it because that's, that's essentially saying that like you would lay two to one. If, if it's 1%, that's like saying you would lay two to one on Daniel when the blinds are sky high, which I think is wrong because because like he does not play a short stack well, but the fact is like two people just get it in a lot at that. I don't remember what the stack depth actually was at that point, but, I, but even if, even on the times where we're, Phil, those runouts where Phil gets back to even, they're not playing deep enough that, that Daniel has just a massive edge in that spot anymore. So it's probably in the 2% neighborhood. Daniel, do you agree with that? I would say it's probably closer to one, you know, because there was still, you know, a decent amount of play. But like he's right in terms of what, what he's talking about is that, you know, at that stage, because the blinds are high, you know, it takes like, all right. So, you know, you're, you know, you're one double, you're, you know, just a couple doubles and, it, and it's even really quickly and doubles can happen when the blinds are high, when we're 300 big blinds deep or 500 mm-hmm. big blinds deep, there's no doubles happening. You know, it's not, it's not happening that way. It's a very, you know, small percentage of your stacks are going in. So obviously, you know, this format benefits him because, you know, variance increases, right? Like if he were to sit down and play, like the similar match that I played for 25,000 hands, then none of this would matter, you know? Cause it's like, there would be, here's the uh, thing. He doesn't, 
he, he's been challenged numerous, numerous times to play a, a hand like you did with Doug and he doesn't, he, he goes on and on and, and does his smoke thing, you know, tries to muddy the waters and then gets his way. Really? Let's be honest. He got his way in this match because he, it's a sit and go and it's not 25,000 hands or some, some large sample where he would have to actually, you know, study to try and to, to win this game. So, I mean, he kind of got his way, right? God, Adam, you got to let the fish have one. I don't know if God is way is how I would phrase it. It's like he said no to one thing. And then the question, like, I don't have to play this thing, but like he's giving away EV anyway, you know, in either format. The question, the issue is just like, he's going to be giving away a lot more if you're playing deep stack poker over 20 right. It's, it's like I said, you got to let the fish have one there, Adam, right? Like it's, 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 this is the thing. It's not like Daniel, Daniel's not going to be like, no, you have to play me 25,000 hands. There's no fucking deal. Like Phil just says like, okay, no. And then Daniel's out the EV that he would have got from playing this thing. <laughs> okay. So let's say you win when you have it 97,000 to 3000, you pick him apart. He doesn't, it's like you said, the friends who bet on him watched it and went, Ooh, Jesus, maybe this isn't good. Do you think Phil rematch asks for a rematch for hundred K if that happens? I think so because it's on TV, you know, if it wasn't on TV and it was just in like a, you know, back room at Aria, he wouldn't do it for sure. But like, because it's on TV and it's good and he likes to be in the limelight and all that kind of stuff, you know, he's going to, I think like, you know, hopefully if everything goes well in the next match uh, and I beat him that, you know, he has an opportunity to, you know, challenge for a third. And I believe he will, even though it's, you know, $200,000, I think that, uh, you know, he won enough off Antonio. Where I mean, it's not about the money for him. He's very nitty with his money. Like he, like you saw on high stakes poker. I mean, they're playing. Well, I don't know, two and four hundred, and they want to kick it up to four eight. And he sell, has to sell pieces at the table, you know, of his action or whatever. But he's got enough money where he doesn't need to do that. But he's just very, very careful with his money. And you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not slighting him for that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, money management. Good. Uh, and the rematch you mentioned. So uh, obviously, your option to rematch, and you're going to do that. Um, what's, can you give us any details or? Yeah. Well, I mean the, the match will start like same format, except we'll start with double the chips, but you know, double the blinds and everything like that. Uh, I wanted to, I don't know when this is going to release, so I don't want to release the date, but I can say that it will be, it'll happen in less than a month. So it's going to take a few weeks, at least less than a month, um, to get everything, all the ducks in a row. I will not be studying. (laughs) I will not, I will be continuing to lose my ass at chess. Cause I'm getting worse. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm getting worse at chess, like significantly. Are you gambling uh, in chess? No, but I mean, I hate losing anyway. Yeah. It doesn't matter you're, what. You're playing random people on the internet or you like, playing- I mean, I, this is what people don't know about me is like, I could, I like, I lost the match to Phil. And then that night or whatever was more tilted because Robin Lehner allowed a goal in a shootout. That cost me a fantasy game in my playoffs for my hockey fantasy team. Hundred dollar buy in fantasy pool? Sixty dollars. It's not even about the money. But <laughs> but ended up being like a great fucking woke up to a great news that Nito Nita Rider, who had an assist, they stripped it. So I ended up winning the game. And so I was like ecstatic. But like people don't get like um monetary value isn't how I get it isn't how I get tilted. I was on the treadmill earlier playing chess because I play when I'm doing that. And I fuck in the middle of walking, I, I blundered. And I just started kicking and screaming like a fucking child. I'm so crazy. It's nuts. <laughs> Terrence is kind of like that with internet poker, I think. Oh, yeah. it's It's been a while. Uh, all right, let's move on. Um, the World Series of Poker, people have been wondering about it. The, the, the poker world's trying to figure out what's going on with the COVID landscape to see if there was going to be a 2021 in-person live World Series of Poker event this year. And on April 1st of all days... The World Fool's Poker decided that it would make an announcement on April Fool's Day that, yes, indeed, there will be World Series of Poker in Las Vegas, uh, September 30th to November 23rd. So there will be a November 9 this year, back uh, old school, which is great. Um, There's not a whole, you know, if you remember how the World Series does this, they release, you know, uh, little bits of information as you go to build up the the excitement and, and the media you know, really, and the media stories and different things. They're not going to come out and give you the whole schedule right here six months early or whatever it is because they want to have the buildup, which is great. Um, so they did announce the dates uh, again, September 30th to November 23rd. Now, first off on the dates, guys, let's, before we go through some of this stuff, that is the dream time for people who don't live in Las Vegas to go to Las Vegas because 
in June and July and, you know, the dates that it, a normal World Series, it's 42 degrees uh, Celsius or 100 and whatever the heck it is Fahrenheit. And it is brutal. Like you, you know, as everybody knows who's been there, I don't have to tell you, walking from one casino to the other, you're, you're in a shower, you're sweating, it's brutal. Um, and it's air conditioning. So uh, talk about the dates, guys. Like, is this, God, can we hope for the fact that this will be oh, the same dates going forward? It makes me jealous that COVID wasn't 10 years ago and that I could have spent the last 10 years. Like, because this is the thing I, I don't, I think it was Olivier Bousquet who said like, okay, guys, this is our shot. Like once we do this, we got to make it permanently. Like let's fight like hell to make it permanent. I Obviously uh, we've talked about the reasons why the world series is held in the summer because, you know, Vegas is slow during that time. And it's easy for the Rio and other Caesar properties to sell rooms during that time. It's a, it's a, it's a draw not much going on during that period. So, you know, it would be, it would be probably a bit naive to hope that this will happen a lot going forward, but, but I mean, it's just, it's fantastic news. I mean, uh, October, November, that's when kind of the rest of much of anyway, the rest of North America and Europe, um, you know, starts getting like cold, starts getting rainy, looking for sunny destinations. Um, and Vegas is very nice in October and, you know, to, a lot of November's too. I mean, it's, it's like kind of hoodie weather sometimes in November, but it's still like, it's still like nice. I mean, there's no snow on the ground. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, it's fantastic. It's going to be exciting. Um, you know, you, imagine just sort of, uh, you know, busting out of a tournament and, and being like, Oh, huh, you know, let's, let, let's go for a walk outside. Let's go on a hike. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's go to, let's go to Red Rock and, and hike. Like usually you, you, people set up hikes at Red Rock they're like, yeah, you want to go hiking at like eight o'clock in the morning and then like finish by nine 30 so that we don't die. Yeah. Um, you know, that's what, what people go hiking in, in Vegas during the world series. Uh, but yeah, super nice, super exciting announcement. I mean, I really had no plan uh, to go to Vegas this year. You know, a, a lot of, a lot of the friends, a lot of my close friends don't live in Vegas anymore. And uh, as I become a little bit, you know, on a personal level, a little bit less competitive in the poker world because I, don't study and um, everybody else does that I was, you know, thinking like, oh, probably not, but I mean, it's, it's very tempting to, to go to the world series in October, November, enjoy that nice weather while, while Canada, well, you know, so that I'm not just shoveling my driveway, uh, which is what I'll be doing in October and November if I'm home. Daniel thoughts on the dates. Well, it's going to be interesting. You know, Terrence hit on a lot of important points where I don't think going forward, this is going to be like the slot for the reasons that he mentioned, which first and foremost, obviously like June, July is dead Vegas time. So that's perfect for them to like have a festival or event like that. Also typically, you know, September, October, um, like you said, it's very, very busy, a lot going on, a lot of competition. We like sports and stuff with basketball and football and hockey and whatnot. But um, I think it's cool for this one, you know, year one off because like obviously Vegas is looking to make a comeback. Uh, hopefully if you know because what do you call it um vaccinations have gone quite well here in nevada like i've gotten my second dose uh about five days ago so i'm about a week before i'm you know fully immune or whatever my basically wide like, open in vegas right like whoever whoever wants it can get it I, I don't even think you even have to show residency if i'm not mistaken right like you just um, I mean, you just, yeah. you're just like a point, person like, you can walk in and get a, get right. a shot yeah. like when when we went to get it they didn't ask any questions they don't ask anything they're just like you're here yeah. to get the vaccine take it and it was empty anyways right so like it was kind of a it wasn't like we were in line or anything we just walked right up and you know mm. we, we got it mm. um but uh yeah i think that like my, well my hope i guess is we don't know what covid um um sort of protocols will look like because it won't work like what they're doing at aria right now which works is like they have to have partitions they have to have like plexiglass and then everybody's masked up right that won't work for the world series of poker in september october yeah. It's far it's, too expensive to, first yeah. of all, build out all those tables of plexiglass um, to separate. And besides, I mean, in a big fucking room, it's like, it's what, how much is that really going to help anyways? Right. Yeah. So my hope is the protocols are loosened by then so that, you know, we can play as normal. Um, hopefully mask wearing will not be a necessity by then, but we don't know, you know, things here have gone really, really well, as I said. And, uh, you know, I hope that we have it, but like, I think it'll be a little bit of a weird series. Cause could you imagine, like, think about it. Like you play a tournament from like noon till two and 2 AM. Like, I mean, I know first line workers and everybody like wears a mask for that much time. And it's, you know, kind of brutal on them, but like, it's not comfortable. I don't think for people to have to wear a mask for 14 hours while they play poker. There's, there's even a lot of things. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to the mask stuff too. Um, so obviously there's some conversation on Twitter, but, um, you know, the, the, the United States is still not open border wise, right? There's still uh, most 
I don't think they're accepting people, the United States is accepting people. Like a lot of still happen. Obviously, vaccination plan is going pretty decently well in the United States and it's going okay in some other countries. Um, but there is, there is, you know, September is really far away. So hopefully by then, like the pen, we can just say the pandemic's over. Like enough people are vaccinated that, that COVID's not really a threat anymore. But th- there is still the fact that people will be traveling from anywhere. So when, you know, we, t- we talk about all the, the COVID protocols that exist now, the, the plexiglass and, um, are they still playing shorthanded everywhere? They, um, do you know that, Daniel? Are they? I don't know. I think I, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, the pictures I've seen, I still never seem to see more than six or seven players at a table. Um, I don't think the World Series would do that. Although, I, if it had to, I mean, that would be pretty sweet too. If every tournament was a seven max tournament or something like that, um, there's there's still a lot to be ironed out um, with with masks with it and, and like what. What what's the the future of traveling to the U.S. even look like? I mean, does the does the U.S. require some proof of vaccination by September to let people in, or are they not? Is it is it just going to be a case where if enough a uh, high enough percentage of Americans are vaccinated that it's like okay, borders open, guys, like you can come if you want, or will they require some sort of proof of COVID vaccine? We we don't know any of these things yet. They're all politically fraught. We don't know whether they'll be arranged. You know, everything will be set up on time. Um, there's still a lot of question marks and uh, it will be really interesting to see how many people ultimately attend these things. But right now I think we don't know enough to really talk intelligently about what we think a world series will look like in September. Well, there's, there's other problems too, right? Like you look at a, a, the Canucks right now, the Vancouver Canucks are going through a terrible situation with, with uh, COVID. Um, and one of the players had COVID and he got it again because it's his. Yeah, pretty- Jace, I spoke to him. He's hair luck. He's, he, I spoke to him about it. Yeah. He's, he got it twice. Cause this is the new variant now, the Brazilian one. Right. Yeah. So now you have all the people in the U S let's say by then they all get uh, vaccinated, but there's these variants out there where people who are vaccinated are getting it or have had it before are getting it. Who knows? Right. We don't know what's going to happen. That's it's scary. Like, you know, I don't know. And, and, you know, for a country like Canada, who we love to get up on our high horse and say how great our healthcare system is better than, you know, other countries, um, you know, we've, we've handled it terribly and, and Shit, I don't, absolute garbage. I'm, I'm embarrassed. Like, I don't mean I'm, I'm still Canadian. Right. But like, I, I'm shocked, frankly, that Canada did such a poor job of the rollout. And when I hear my brother and, or, you know, and his wife who are, you know, they should be eligible. They should have been vaccinated a long time ago. Like telling you, you know, you get your first fact shot and then you got to wait four months for your second. It's like, what the fuck happened over there? It's, yeah. well, it's, a, it's a supply problem. It's a distribution problem. It's everything. I mean, we just, we just didn't have we just didn't have any ability to manufacture vaccines, and now we're depending on the U.S. So, well, we had a year, right? We had a year, over a year to figure it out, and yeah. and we didn't. And then it's it's just embarrassing. We, you know, you have the might of the federal government to be able to to find a way to produce it, and they just didn't. Yeah, uh, so so we don't know how many Canadians will be at the World Series, well, that's that's the thing. or pick another country too. So yeah. if it's Americans. Yeah. Or primarily Americans. What does that World Series of Poker look like? And and I was listening to the Fives, awesome podcast by the way. If you're into poker podcasts and you don't know about the Fives, uh, check that one out. Um, and and they were talking. Donnie and Lance were saying that they think that the the main event will break records. And I'm thinking to myself, really? Like we don't have yeah. really any idea of where it will be. Yeah, there's pent up demand. I get that. Bitcoin's at its uh, you know crazy, and everybody's you know who got into crypto has a ton of money to go play poker, but are we sure that this thing's going to break records? right now? If I was going to bet on it, I bet on the under on, on the under of whatever the it's yeah. 8,700, I think is the current record. Um, but like, yeah, right now I like the under, but things could change, right? Like th- if the, if the borders are fully open and you know, you get like 70% of the population worldwide is vaccinated. Okay. Then I can see the over, I can see the overcome in. And like you said, Bitcoin, you know, um, just looking huge, but yeah, I could, I could see it. Um, you know, when online, online poker sites are obviously going to start, you know, GG for sure, but all the online poker sites to start running their satellites. I could, I could see it right now. You make me bet. I like the under on 8,700 or whatever it is. Yeah. I think it's going to depend on legislation because COVID fatigue is real, right? Mm-hmm. I think people are there. That's why we're seeing some spikes in a lot of places. Cause people are like, all right, it's fucking it's pretty close to over. Might as yeah. well just be over. And I think when people, uh, are, you know, the floodgates do open where people can, you know, go more free like i for me like i've been fine me and my wife were totally good with the the quarantine but like now that we've gotten back like i'm actually excited now to leave my house which you know we don't really do but i'm excited to actually go to a dinner you know and i'm excited to play live poker and all these kind of things it's just around the corner and i think there's going to be a lot of people with that mindset similar to mine even more so that save up some money 
to, uh, you know, make a trip to Vegas and live a little bit and play the World Series of Poker? Uh, the opening weekend is going to feature, this is from the press release, it's going to feature a special charity event to benefit frontline health workers. Awesome. Uh, a $25,000 horse event that I'm sure uh, one of our hosts will be playing in. And a $5 million guaranteed no limit hold of event called the reunion, which uh, uh, the other host of this event might be playing it if he's there. Uh, awesome uh, to get some of the details started. Um, and what's the reunion? It, so it's, I guess it's a, it's a 5 million guaranteed. So I want to guess it's like a thousand dollar buy-in. It'll probably be one of those, um, you know, multi-flight uh, reunion. What's the reunion got to do with it? That's what I was wondering. Is it like a reunion? Because like we, is it's like a COVID reunion? Like uh, we all haven't played poker together in a long time. I was trying to think that too. Like, why is it called the reunion? Yeah. <laughs> uh, main event is going to begin uh, Thursday, November 4th and run through Wednesday, November 17th. So if you're interested in playing the main event, those are the dates, November 4 to 17. Uh, go book your rooms now while you can uh, before they fill up, especially, again, if it's a busier time of year in Las Vegas uh, when uh, in November. So you might want to get those rooms early this year. Uh, there'll be four starting days, you know, uh, Thursday, November 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th through the Sunday. Um, and players participating, as always, Thursday and Friday, get their day two on Monday, um, et cetera. So it's staggered sort of normally. Um, so yeah, exciting. And, and we're going to get more, uh, you know, events as they come, come, they come out, we'll talk about each of them, um, and, uh, and go through the schedule as it comes out. Uh, but fantastic news that we're getting back into it. One other quick thing before we jump into some tweets and voicemails, uh, Mike Postle, we talked a lot about the Mike Postle cheating scandal. Uh, you'll remember back, I, I want to say it was more, a little more than a year ago, um, Mike was uh, cheating on a live stream at uh, a casino that was uh, live streaming their poker game. And he was winning and winning and winning and couldn't help himself. And just, we went through it. And uh, he uh, filed a lawsuit against Daniel and a bunch of other people in the poker community uh, because everybody was saying that he cheated when he obviously did. And uh, he has dropped that lawsuit uh, without prejudice and, and now faces uh, a whole bunch. He, he named so many people in that, and each of them had to get legal representation. So now, um, because he dropped them with a prejudice, he now is on the hook for. Uh, legal I know. I'm so fucking jealous that, like, aren't you jealous, Adam? You didn't yes, get named. Like, we we call them a fucking cheat all the time, and we didn't get nothing. <laughs> Bullshit. When you know oh. you've made it, right? When you're on the name, when you're on the list, oh, like, oh, sweet, apparently I got to work. It. I got to I got to hit that grind. But fucking Mike Postle, you cheated. All Dude. I did was made a video that I stole from freaking Matt Salzberg, where I just put the video on and I just looked into it and I said, you know, well, I titled it like my, my response to what, you know, is going on and thing. And I just went and looked in the camera and I said, he cheated. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but then we as a group had Veronica Brill on for like 40 minutes to yeah. talk about how he cheated. And still we got what, no respect. You feel no slighted. Respect. You wanted to be in on it. I'm fucking angry. <laughs> Good luck collecting the uh, court costs though. I guess that's the only downside, right? I mean, you're going to have to, it's going to be a lot too for, for all the different people that he named. Uh, all right, let's get on to some tweets, Roscoe. You're going surfing on the internet. Uh, Ike Haxton tweets, and this is back. Uh, we talked uh, about the um, Doug Polk fold to Phil Helmuth on high six poker. You'll remember that uh, the flop came uh, Jack nine, eight, and Doug Polk had 10, seven off in the big blind and Phil had queen 10. So uh, it was uh, nuts versus lower straight. And uh, Doug check raised the flop and Phil shoved for like nine X and moved all in and Doug made, found a fold. People and, in general uh, are really afraid of me. And Axton, he, uh, he said, it's a bit much for everyone to be talking about the greatest lay down in history um, in a hand where one of the opponents is barely even playing poker, which I thought was great. And Daniel, does Ike make that fold? Oh, against Phil. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think pretty much like that's the thing is like everyone's like, and it was a great fold. I'm not taking anything away from it. It's obviously very, very good. But like, you're looking at a man who like instantly jammed, right? And Bryn actually, because you know, Bryn picks up on tells, he's one because like someone said, well, he could have had nines or jacks. He's like, no, he couldn't have. Yeah. Because he wouldn't have like, he would have at least thought about it. He talked himself out of having a set. Yeah. Right. He would have at least thought about it for a minute and he would, well, he wouldn't jam there, but you know, he just has like queen 10 always. 
All right, I put out the tweet today uh, for people asking for requests for the podcast, uh, topics, et cetera. Jackie Oliver writes in, uh, Daniel's impression of Patrick when talking to Ivy about props, please. Uh, you, do you feel like doing that, Daniel? Well, let me see if I remember it. It's like, Phil, why is always your way? Something like that. <laughs> Phil, why, why is always your way? Because like every time they made a mistake, yeah. it would always be in like Phil's favor. <laughs> this is all because of the props. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Ooh, uh, that's nasty. That's a triple. Dipple. Uh, Daniel, this is uh, episode 98. And yeah. we put a lot of pressure on you for episode 100. Okay, cool. He's okay. Canadian. <laughs> to, uh, Check, he checks his watch like, oh, I'm going to call him in like 20 minutes. Is he he checks his I'll text him. He might be it's waking easy. up right about now. I'll is text it? one of his 14 phone numbers. <laughs> We have no idea whether this show is going to be in, in five days or in three months. We, this is I think true. The last we time just, I spoke we just said 100. We didn't, we didn't say when 100 would be. We might, <laughs> might just do it like we did in the old podcast. What do we, we well, I think we, we've just done two shows in, in a very short amount of time. It was a long time before that. Great, so. It's great to get back doing shows. Uh, more yeah, on. no. Yeah, I love it. All right. Uh, Terrence, you had a couple of tweets. Yeah. I just, it's, this isn't even a poker tweet. I just thought it was funny. The Bitcoin tweet. Someone at Blair S. Wealth, little sister asked me for one Bitcoin for her birthday. Me, what? $58,554, $57,420 is a lot of money. What do you need $60,369 for anyway? That was a it's funny. Kind of like four seconds. I like it. I get funny it. Thing, I, just, I just refreshed and it's pretty close to the first number right now. So that's about as stable as it gets. Uh, Lane Flack uh, tweeted a, a video. Um, you'll have to go to to obviously this is we can't play it right now but uh at back to back flack uh lane flack tweeted i came across this video and it got to me the wsp will be at the end of september this year and said that old g smith uh won't be there of course gavin a friend of all of ours in the show and uh one of the let's i mean no disrespect to daniel but the most entertaining canadian poker player of all time uh gavin smith um he's canadian he's, what, what he seems to be doing you guys correct me if I'm wrong, is he seems to be bowling with his crotch in this video. Well, he's trying to do it with his butt and avoid his, he's bowling, but he's trying to like, he's not trying, he's trying not to hit his crotch. He's trying to bowl with his right. ass. I don't know if you guys know, I mean, obviously this is some sort of prop bet where it's like he has to bowl a striker to make it to the end of the lane with bowling with his butt, but he's got a bowling ball between his legs and he's scooting on the floor on his hands and heels, trying to hit the ball with his ass. And, uh, I mean, just go check out the video if you want. But I mean, it, it, that pretty solidly encapsulates um, the the life of Gavin Smith. I think. Um, I think we all. Uh, must, I just want to. Yeah, we miss Gavin so much, and y you you never be around a more entertaining human. He was just he was just the life of the party wherever he went. It was you know crazy stuff. Uh, and yeah, I got one I more tweet, and I forgot to forgot to forgot to put it in here. But, um, oh, I do have it. Okay, I got it up. I, I'll just read it to y'all. Um, but um, Adam, Adam, not, I wouldn't say got into it slightly, but, but disagreed with a take from, from Todd Wittellis. And we, we, we kind of, um, you know, we alluded to this earlier before, but Todd Wittellis, um, guy who's been in the poker world a long time, bit of a bit of a pot stir is, uh, is old. I thought he was going to say putts. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> putts. <laughs> pot stir. Somebody who likes the controversy in poker, but Todd Wittellis, at Todd would tell us, I will be at the WCP this fall if there's no mask mandate and I will stay home if a mask is required. I must imagine others feel the same way. No, may, no way am I going to commit to all those hours in a forced mask while contaminated, something, uh, while vaccinated, excuse me, not contaminated. Um, something that, that Daniel just kind of alluded to earlier that it's, that it is uncomfortable, pretty uncomfortable to play a mask for six to eight hours. Uh, poker days even go longer than that. Uh, Adam, you quote tweeted this. You said, People drawing strange lines in the sand, part 58. That suggests to me that you do not agree with the idea that um, that it's reasonable to... I mean, you're a poker player and it's the World Series of Poker. It's the premier event. It hasn't mm -hmm. happened for two years. And you're going to stay home because you have to wear a mask while you're playing poker? Like I, I, that, I just, I mean, I wear a mask all day at work. It, it doesn't bother me. I, it does it. Is it slightly uncomfortable? I'm used to it now. I, it yeah. doesn't bother me a little bit. I, it's just that I find, you know, and, and this isn't a slight to Americans. It's just a different mentality, I think, that Americans have than maybe people in the other rest of the world. And it's this min minuscule infringement on their freedoms. They get, they just totally get their back up. And 
you know, will forego something like the World Series of Poker that Todd clearly loves. And he thinks it's, you know, he, he's got a bracelet. He talks about it all the time. It's, it's certainly he loves poker. Like, so he'll not go play in the World Series of Poker because he has to wear a mask. And, and I just don't get it. I, I, I don't understand that. It's beyond me. I, I don't know what else. Yeah, to I mean, for the, I mean, as a general rule of sight, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's crazy that people are freaking out about the fact that they have to go to Costco and wear a mask because I think that's silly. Um, because it's like whatever you're you're in Costco. How long are you be there? You mean they're like forty? Minutes. I saw I, one of my favorite follows on Twitter is is you should follow it. It's a uh, well, I and mean, you shouldn't if you hate this stuff. But at Crazy Karens, it's called <laughs> at Crazy Karens, and I saw a video recently where this one Karen she went into a store and there was like a mask mandate, right? Um, and she had a mask on that was string here all around and then an outline here. So there was a black string here, a black string here, but it was all a hole in the middle, right? And she was trying to argue that the mask mandate says I have to be wearing it on my face and I'm wearing it on my face and nor does it say it has to be covering my mouth and shit like that. Like the amount of crazy, the, the level of crazy people are willing to go to to just like prove a point on this. I think they may have been like the thinnest mesh over the middle. Right. And, it, she, and either way, she went to like a, a she, it was hard to make this mask is one of so, one. <laughs> so, so it, it, it raises an interesting part. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't quite finish on that topic, but I mean, I sort of stand somewhere in between the idea of, you know, you should, you should, you have a right to not wear a mask inside the grocery store and playing 10. I mean, you know, like these poker tournaments go on a long time. You only get a break every two hours. Like you gotta play two hours straight with a mask on. Like, what are we going to, there's a lot of things we're going to do. What are we going to do about eating and drinking at the table? Like, you know, people eat and drink at the table normally during the World Series, like the, the restaurants um, inside the Rio rely on this business. But this brings up another good point is that like we've had a real hard time defining what a, a mask is and a facial covering. So if the, these people wear these, you know, you've seen these people, I've seen them at stores, they wear those like weird kind of, well, it's like a mask that a welder would wear. It's like plastic over there. Like that fucking mask isn't doing anything. Like, are that going to be okay? Like the, the, the people who wear the mask below the nose, like is, you know, are, are, is every dealer and every floor man going to, is a floor man willing to disqualify a player if they're not wearing a mask? correctly and and you know to, to todd's point i see it there's going to be a large percentage of the field that has had both of their shots and is vaccinated and they're not going to want to wear the mask and it's you know yeah, they there's you know, the thing there is i think it's a reasonable discussion to, to have i mean as far as people getting their vaccinations and shouldn't have to wear a mask there's it, it, would, it would create a logistical nightmare to try and filter out who doesn't have to wear a mask because they so that's not a you know, to, to point to that and go, well, you, why are you forcing people? It's, well, they're not, it, theoretically, it's just because it's impossible to go through everybody's information to try and figure that out. So it's easier to just mandate masks and you know, whatever. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't it, it think it's all a moot point because by that, I want to say by that time, you probably won't have to wear a mask at that, you know, in the U.S. because um, yeah, I, I, I think I think you're right. I think the, well, I think this is state by state stuff. Uh, so like Nevada probably won't force the the World Series to enforce a mask mandate. Um, but you know, this is something that Daniel's mentioned in the past. Like when you see, uh, you know, when when SARS hit in uh, 2002, one, you you saw this rise of people wearing eight, uh, masks in Asia. And you know, Daniel always likes to mention John Juanda would show up at a lot of these tournaments and he would be wearing a mask. And he was like, where, you know, John, why are you wearing a mask? Like, are you just, are you, are you some kind of germaphobe? And it would just be like, no, it's just like, I, I had a, a bit of a sore throat and I don't want to pass this along to people. And Adam, when you say like, there's a, there's a cultural difference, like America's always like my freedoms, I, I got the right to not wear a mask. And then, but, uh, but people in, in a lot of Asian cultures, they're, they're like, well, you know, I might be sick. So I'm going to like try to protect other people and, you know, um, maybe not give them this cold that I have. You know, you do wonder whether there will be some pivoting towards that. You know, it's like you wake well, up in the morning. And you a huge amount of pivoting. Well, it's you're, totally you're, society. I, I think, in, especially maybe outside of the U.S., like in Vancouver, I think you'll see, even after everybody's vaccinated, you know, two years from now, a large pop percentage of the population are going to be wearing masks around this. Oh, you're going to see people wearing masks at a poker table because they want to cover their face. Like, yeah. that's a thing. Like, no joke. Like, when Antonio was going to play Phil again, Phil wanted to wear the mask. Because he wanted to cover his face for like, you know, physical tells and stuff like that against him. He was like, you know, not, well, I mean. I mean, basically. how long have, how, how long have we been seeing like scarves and turtlenecks kind of just, yeah. getting, you know, like we've been seeing that long before we had any reason right. to. Like to I would expect, reason. I would expect Christoph Vogel saying, exactly. and you know, the crew 
to have like a very extensive mask that covers literally everything and a robot spacesuit. <laughs> All right, let's get on to some voicemails. Email number one. Hey guys, this is Dave from East Cleveland, a uh, big fan of the show. You know, I love Daniel and what he brings, but I got to tell you that uh, podcast, the most recent podcast was the best podcast you guys have ever done. It was hilarious for an hour and 10 minutes straight. I loved the Survivor talk. I'm surprised because I know Daniel likes Survivor so much, but you guys nailed it. Couldn't have done any better. Hilarious show. Keep up the good work. Uh, Daniel, yeah, I mean, great to have you back. I, I mean, yeah, in, but these guys, oh, you killed it, guys. Great stuff. Let me guess. Let me guess. This uh, voicemail was recorded last Thursday. Yeah, around that time. Yeah. Was it your dad or something? <laughs> <Kind of paid him. laughs> no, it was Dave in East Cleveland. <laughs> Dave in East Cleveland. Just no, we we we. This, somebody asked the survivor question. We're like, I, I don't know. We don't know fucking anything about survivor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, there was a. a well, I, we I, pe- the people probably wanted to know Daniel's answer, but it was basically, "What odds would you give yourself to win Survivor, and yeah. why did poker players do so?" Oh, poorly? yeah, yeah, good, good, good callback. Yeah. Okay, what, so what there's usually that? about twenty people, so that's five percent. I think it's really, really hard to win, and I think it'd be really hard for me to win for various reasons. But I would still give myself a better than average chance. So I would say between eight to ten percent, like right around eight or nine percent, something like that. All okay. right. Why do poker players do terrible at, at Survivor? Was part of the question. Well, the ones that went on, it was really, really strange, right? Like JRB. This, you know, I've told the story before, but he knew I was a big fan of the show. And before he went on, he came and asked me for three pieces of, for for advice. I gave him literally three pieces of advice of things to do. He broke all three on the very first episode. <laughs> I said, number one, make sure the women like you. Number two, don't speak loudly in open spaces. And number three, don't call anybody out. Okay. Women hated him. He was in the middle of the freaking lake talking about how he's going to hit this chick and bang this. And then he ended up calling out the guy who won it and saying like, you, you're kind of shifty. You seem like a, you know, you're like a smart one. I'm like, okay. So there's that one. Garrett Great. Adelson. Yeah. Garrett Adelson went on the show and Garrett went on the, went on the show with like 0.0000001% body fat. Which is dumb. Okay. It's really dumb. Like he's really big and strong. But like I imagine he was probably before that, like eating 3000 calories a day or, or something to keep that body in that, you know, frame. And then you go on an Island. There's no fucking food. It's going to make you cranky. And Garrett made one of the most cardinal sins you can make where he basically tried to get people to not talk. He basically like asked people to not do the show. Right. And when you're a big, strong guy like that, you are not in jeopardy of going home early. Unless you say something, you could literally not say a word, just be a big, strong guy, help out, do nothing. You can't go out early because they need you, right? He was, he was kicked out early because he was trying to run things too quickly. Then you had Anna Kite, who is now known as the demon slayer or whatever, <laughs> like the fucking, whoever she is, man. She's fucking she heathens and charlatans and demons and wizards, <laughs> fucking psycho Q shit. Um, she went on there and I don't know, she just, I don't know. She didn't seem to play the game really. Didn't really, you know, get involved. And then you had Ronnie Barda and Ronnie, I felt bad for him. Cause I'm like, that's not the Ronnie I know. So he was a little bit sick before he went out there. I think that affected him. Like, and he was like, he acted crazy and paranoid. Like then nobody bought him, you know? And, and I think also going on the show and going on the show as a card player, a poker player, part yes. of people think of that is they think of the term bluffing and they think of bluffing as being lying think of being shady so you, you already go in with like you know a lack of trust but it's surprising when you see like guys like ronnie you know jrb did make it to the merge but garrett like when you're this is just a fact okay when you're in a you know when you're a physically strong male in this show doesn't mean you're gonna win but you're usually not supposed to get knocked out early that's like a thing if you're older if you're not as physically you know uh good you know strong uh, in the challenge or whatever, those are usually the weak links that go first, right? And it's funny because with the poker players we have, we didn't have any weak links um, from a physical standpoint, but they were just weak in gameplay. I don't know, like you have it's to like me to put out good vibes, you know, good vibe, Ron. Good vibe, Ron. Yeah, you gotta like take it slow, I think. And sometimes, like if you're a poker player or whatever, you know, you're thinking of like what's the and you can outplay yourself. You know, you just need to just chill. 
go, you know, take it easy and, and be likable, but not too likable, which I do pretty well, I think. Cause like some people fucking hate me and so, <laughs> some people kind of like me and some people like me a lot. So there's a whole spectrum. <laughs> uh, voicemail number two. All right. So uh, we we got demonetized for playing the Law and Order theme, so I can't do that anymore. But what happened? What happened? I, it, it just there's an algorithm that catches that stuff. So do 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 do. You don't think the algorithm get that too? Do do. Email number do. Hey guys, I love the podcast. I first want to just say you guys are excellent hosts, and you do such a good job of keeping the flow going keeping the topic uh, very concise and pertinent. You guys give a lot of valuable information, so thank you. I wanted to uh, share just a brief story on my experience at the 2019, no, 18 um, World Series of Poker. I played in the $500 buy-in, 50000 starting stack, and there was a 25000 chip that was so close in color to the $100 chip. Um, it was like a pink, and everyone would get confused, and so we were kind of helping each other um, realize, oh, you accidentally played your 25000 and the dealer kept reminding everybody, be careful with that 25000 And I won a pot, and as I'm dragging the pot towards me, I noticed there was a 25000 chip in the pot, and it was, this was in the earlier round, so it was definitely a mistake. And so my instinct was just to say, hey, there's a 25000 chip in there. And so everyone did a brief accounting of their stacks, and this guy realized, like, whoops, that was mine. I accidentally threw it in there. And so I gave him his chip back, and he gave me a 100 chip. And so I guess my question is, would you guys have done the same thing? Uh, I, I followed my heart, which I think is correct, but he actually ended up being the one to knock me out later on when I had about 15, 20 big blinds. He was super aggro and was raising literally every other hand, and uh, he was in the cutoff. And um, I re-raised him all in with ace-five suited in the small blind, and he had aces, and so I got popped and was out. But So then I regretted that decision to do that and be honest. But So my heart <laughs> says I did the right thing, but my brain is like, what are you doing, man? I could've, that would have really helped me out. But just curious what your guys' thoughts are on that. Thanks again. Well, can I start by saying no good deed goes unpunished? Because <laughs> that's what <laughs> happened here, right? I'm going to let you guys answer and say what would you do. Karma is not a thing, clearly. Uh, I think that's a no-brainer. Yeah, you you definitely return the chip. Right. right. If there's if it's later in the tournament where it's even plausible that that chip got into play normally, then yeah. But I mean, if it's your like early blind level, you have to give it back. Like, I mean, this is the thing. Like the alternate universe where you where you keep the chip. Like, how good do you feel about yourself at the end of the day? Yeah. You know, when you're racking up at the end of the day, and this fucking poor guy. Like, like I'm, I mean, like, actually, let's let's make this a more concrete situation. Let's say you say nothing. Half an hour later, you know, this guy's playing a big the guy the guy you ripped off, you know, who lost his twenty five k. You know, he gets involved in hand. Somebody's like, "Hey, how much you got?" And cuts out his chips. He's like, "Huh, I got seven thousand, but I haven't played a single pot all day. And who I has with fifty thousand more than they're supposed to? What's that?" They'll say who has more than they're supposed to. Oh, you do. Why? They're, they're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like well, I never put my twenty five k chip in the pot. Where is it? Where is it? I mean, I wasn't even thinking of that. You're right, Adam. Like you're gonna actually get caught. I didn't even think of that. But but you're gonna you're gonna be sitting there going like, like you know, like you gotta act like you didn't do anything wrong when you know you just stole this twenty five k chip from the guy. Like you're gonna feel awful. I, I mean, just like and you can tell from the fact that that what I don't I didn't catch. Um, caller's name but but the fact of what he done he is an honest person at part so you can't you can't like you're you're gonna feel awful and as adam pointed out you're gonna get caught because you're gonna be the only guy probably at the table with a 25k chip because everybody tends to remember the big pots of the day the only way you kind of actually get rid of it is the table breaks which is in a big in big tournaments like that does happen but you're gonna feel so bad about it i mean the, here's a, a sort of more interesting thing let's say you're the tournament director and you're called over like 10 minutes later like 10 minutes after this pot has happened. And like, you go to the dealer and the deal same dealer has been dealing the whole time. And he's like, what's the biggest pot that's been played at the table? And the dealer's like 3K. And then you look over and you see one guy's got two 25K chips. What do you do? Well, I was going to go a different way with the question. With the, I was, I'm shocked that a tournament director wasn't called because they should be for something like this. And I'm, yeah. I'm shocked that the tournament director would allow for the chip to be given back because there's a mm -hmm. rule in tournaments where once the next hand starts, Whatever happened in the last hand is accepted action, right? So, for example, like if you're playing pot limit Omaha and someone bets 10K, but there was only 5K in the pot and the other person calls the 10K, 
like that's considered accepted action. You move on to the next hand, unless it's called immediately before the hand's you know done or whatever the case may be. So in this case, when there's an error like that, I don't think it's as clear as you guys are on it. Like I think a, obviously like the good, you know, the good heart thing, the nice the feeling thing is to do that. But from a like competitive perspective, first of all, there shouldn't be chips that are so fucking egregious like yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> world series. But then, <laughs> then you have to ask the question, like, are you placing this on the player? to do the right thing. And then are you putting yourself at a financial disadvantage? If you're the guy who says, I'll give the chip back, but the other eight players at the table would not give the chip back. Right. Because th there's no reason why you owe that chip. Right. There's no, right. like, there's no rule that states, well, this guy just picked up an extra 25 K chip. Well, such is life, bro. You know, you know, everyone's responsible for their own stack and their own chip. Obviously it sucks. Obviously the nice thing to do would be to give the chip back. But from a competitive perspective, when, you know, there's money on the line, if you do that and others don't, are you giving up, you know, equity that, uh, that, you know, that's that no one would do for you. It that makes it, makes it a lot, a lot easier to swallow. If, if the tournament director says, no, you can't give it back. But if everybody's staring at you, especially in a $500 event where everybody's like happy to be there and nobody, not many professionals. It's just going to be super you'd awkward. Be like, yeah. You, you just look like the biggest asshole. I would, <laughs> yeah, do, this. It, 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 I would do this personally. What I would do is I'd call the floor yeah. and I'd ask the floor to make a ruling. I say, floor, this 25K chip, this 25K chip, uh, this guy must've put the wrong chip in the pot. It's in my stack. The hand was three hands ago. What's your ruling? Whatever yeah. he says, that's what I do. And if, that, you were the I would handle it. if you're the tournament director, Daniel, and they called you over and you're wearing the suit, and what do you say? Oh boy. Um, well, I mean, listen, I, I would go by what the rule says, which is, would be bad news for the, for the, for the, the player who screwed up. Cause um, like, it's, I just, I think it's ambiguous. I think it's difficult to like, not, you know, in the, you know, when, when the hands, I can see it open. both ways because yeah, what's, what's happened, like what happened three hands ago shouldn't be reversible. Like 99.9% .9 of the time you should not reverse something that didn't just because happen. it affects action too. Yeah. Like, so it yeah. could affect action. What if that player who didn't have the chip, whatever, went all in short stacked, Mm -hmm. you know, and then somebody else fucking called because they were short stacked and they lost the pot. You know what I mean? Like there's a domino like, effect. Everything, that, yeah, the butterfly, the butterfly thing, everything effect, changes. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I think like it's a, it's a shitty situation, but I think like, I think the only ruling you can really make. Adam, is what, Adam, Adam what do you late. think? And then, and then I kind of want to tweet this at like, at like Matt Savage and see what he thinks about this, but it's an interesting situation, but Adam, what do you, what's your ruling? If I, if I call you over, well, let me grab my phone and we'll phone Matt and find out what he would do. But <laughs> For real, right? Um, no, I think, um, well, this strikes me, and without knowing the, the exact rule, this strikes me a lot as the, the same with, uh, um, can you, do you know for sure when somebody throws their hand in, a winner in and it hits the muck, but you know exactly which two cards he threw in mm -hmm. and you reasonably take those cards, turn them over and decide that that was the hand and the pot or whatever. You know how that rule is, right? You, yep. you can reasonably assume that those are not person's cards. Well, yeah, the only difference though is because this could affect action, right? Oh, if yeah. five hands, yeah. You can also you can also ask, like it played three hands ago. Did anybody make a big raise and it, did it material? Yep. It material if we got the same dealer, we got all the players agree that nobody's played a pot over 2K. Then. Right. Did it yeah. make a huge difference in any hand to play? Did somebody count him down when he raised? I mean, we're talking about early levels it sounds like so if you if i could you know if, if i was the able if i was able to and i was the tournament director to be able to reasonably assume that that didn't change anything i'd give the chip back i think so too but i think you should also text matt and see what he would do okay well, we'll ask <laughs> uh, i right. don't think you stuff like that i think it's really important not to put on the players you know it's really like if you can't like if you're the tournament director you need to make a ruling you can't go like right. You guys yeah. like, well, what do you guys think is fair? That's not. No, 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 no. But I, what I was saying was the tournament director should go over and ask the dealer, like, was there, was no, there enough? No, of course. Yeah. I'm just saying, time. like, if yeah. you put this guy who has the extra chip in the worst no, position ever, he looks like a heel if he wants to keep it, you know? Yeah. And then, like, if he doesn't, it's just You're awkward. So just let the tournament director do it. And don't be like, oh, well, you guys figured amongst yourselves. Because some tournament directors might be like, well, do you guys all accept that this chip was this person's? Like, maybe the person does want to keep the chip, right? Uh -huh. Like they think that they should, but they don't want to look like an asshole that's greedy and whatever. So let the tournament director make a ruling and end it there. Matthew Savage. What's up? I heard I just heard Daniel talking about the tournament director. Oh my god, this is amazing. <laughs>
All right. Uh, we have a phone call. We have a question. You're, you're on the Dat Poker podcast, uh, as you have been many times before. Um, the question is, and I don't know if people can make up this audio, but here I'll, I'll... Yeah, you can hear it. Okay. So the question is, uh, a, a, play, uh, a guy came out to Las Vegas to play in the World Series of Poker. It was a $500 event. It was a $50,000 starting stack. It sounded like it was in the early levels. And he won a pot, a very small pot. And when he was pushing, pulling the pot in... Because the $25,000 chip and the $100 chip were very similar colors, he looked at the pot and there was a $25,000 chip or 25, T25,000 chip in the pot instead of the 100 that it should have been. And his, he gave the chip back to the person and the person gave him 100, 100 uh, chip uh, in return for changing the 25K out. The question we have is... Um, as a tournament director, if you're called over three hands later because it's noticed, um, do you give that chip back to that person? No, because he probably didn't call that amount, right? No, he, he called it as it was a hundred dollar chip. He he the the person who right, the, 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 who bet it bet it as a hundred chip, right? Yeah. Then I would I would let I would let that stand. I would let the person have that 25. I mean, it seems like it's a pretty easy misunderstanding. So you would give the, you would give the 25 T 25,000 chip back and trade for the hundred, even if it's three or four hands later. Uh, yes, definitely in that spot, because again, that was the assumption by both players. Uh, and I'm sure by the dealer as well. The dealer didn't catch it. If the player had put out that amount and in air, and then the player says, okay, I call and then put out the amount of the 25000 Even though that was an error at that spot, I'm probably not going to uh, make that correction. But because both players were under the assumption that it was 100 it seems like a pretty, uh, pretty easy misunderstanding in that spot. Okay, Daniel's point is, what if this happens and it affects action? Like it comes over and that that having that person having that chip affected action in a subsequent hand. Does that matter? Does that matter? Uh, yeah. I can, can make a difference. I mean, the guy could be busted and that spot. He could be busted in the fact that he bet in a, and he may have bet 25,000, uh, in a later spot. You understand what I'm saying? If there was, if the action was affected, it could quite possibly be too late to do that. I'm not going to go into a third player stack, and then pull that 25,000 out. But if it's between those two players and has an affected action, of course, then I'm going to uh, okay. so if allow it, that to be returned. If it affected action, if you can if you can go back and then maybe it was 10 hands and one of the hands that affected action, you would not give the chip back then. Right, and you'd have to go to surveillance on something like that. Obviously, you're not going to just take a person's work for it. That the, hey, I, I gave 25,000 in this spot. And, you know, it may be that it might be too late also. You know, if it's 10 hands later, that's probably too late. You know what I mean? It's not going to be one of those situations where you can go back and find that out. Because in both spots, we do not want to go to the, the surveillance, you know, for a pot that is you know, more than one or two hands down. But in that one, with the way you explained it the first time, it seems like it's a pretty simple mistake made by both players. And uh, if the dealer can verify, you know, the dealer's still there, that it was a mistake and the player bet this amount and the player called that amount uh, and it was ruled as 100 in that pot, I think it makes perfect sense to give that back. Okay. And then the last question is, uh, what do you think of uh, Thomas Nosek's 200-foot game uh, this season? <laughs> actually, actually, never mind. You don't, you don't know anything about hockey, so we, won't, we don't care. Oh, you just get, you get to call him and then diss him. Better coach than Gerard Gallant. That's all I'll oh, that's a shot across Daniel's bow. I like it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Okay, guys. Uh, so interesting, right? Um, I think he probably agreed with all of us on some level. Yeah. I th- I, yeah, it's, it's a judgment call, it sounds like. It, it depends kind of what's happened in the interim. I think if you've got a bunch of nothing pots happen in the interim, that is three or four nothing pots that you give the guys chip back. If there was like a big all in that involved this guy, then you can't give him his chip back. I think that's pretty much the answer. But fun. Nice. Also, if you ever find yourself in that tournament again, keep the 25K chips separate. Like, don't put it in your tag. Don't start fucking shuffling your chips. Just keep it separate out there in its own little island in front of the rest of your chips. 
And yeah, the World Series shouldn't be doing that. They should just give people five, five extra 5K chips, but they're probably low on run. Probably. Uh, all right, that's going to wrap it up for this week. Thanks uh, to everybody for getting together so quickly and, uh, and having a long show. That was awesome. Um, and we will talk to you soon.